look into the mirror and I see that reflection in my eyes. I wonder if I'll be weary forever or if I'll cut this ugly picture down to size. I don't want your woeful pity. I don't need a miraculous saint to light the way. I don't need a song and dance that's pretty. I just need for you to believe me when I say that it wasn't me that had the problem. It's just me that's left to carry on. It wasn't me that had the problem. It's just me that's left to sing this old blues song. I swear sometimes this world is crazy with all the dark dead air live tonight our show topic is sexual abuse and um, I'm trying to remember in November I was approached by a member of the community who was working with a group of young women who were themselves sexual abuse survivors and they had put together a play about their experience that they had wanted to um, broadcast on our show. As it turned out, in December sometime, one of the young women in the group was abused again, and they were unable to um, partake in this show. I decided at that point that I wanted to do a show on the subject of sexual abuse um, as a way to acknowledge that it happens and to explore some of the reasons why it happens with my guest tonight and offer hope in the way of intervention and prevention. My first guest this evening is a woman named Fran Rowley, and she is a coordinator of the Child Abuse Treatment Team at Somerville Mental Health, and is also on the adjunct faculty at the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology. And you've been working in the Somerville area for 13 years? Right. Okay. My next guest that I will speak to following our tape insert is Elizabeth Sean Viner, and she is a child interview specialist at the Child Abuse Unit at the Middlesex DA's office. And my final guest is Debbie Lewis, and she's a Community Education Coordinator at the Massachusetts CAP Prevention Center. So we'll be all speaking with each other. And I just want to say that um, the topic of sexual <coughs> abuse is um, a pretty serious one. And for those of you who may yourself be a sexual abuse survivor, I want to say that um, you're not alone. and at you know, just if you're watching a show like this, it might bring up certain feelings. Um, and at the end of the show, we're going to list some names and numbers that you'd be able to reach. But even if those aren't the places that you go to for support, that it would be helpful probably to go and talk to somebody. And I'll be telling you that <laughs> again and again. But why don't I first turn to you, Fran, and ask you if you could just sort of give us a definition of, like, what is sexual abuse? What are we talking about? Sure. Um, I'd like to use the uh, definition that comes from the National Center for Child Abuse and Neglect because it's fairly comprehensive. And they define intrafamily sexual abuse as abuse that's perpetrated upon a child by a member of the child's family group, people living in the, in the home. Mm -hmm. uh, and it includes not only abuse that's designed to stimulate the child sexually, but also, also to stimulate uh, someone else, perhaps the, the offender. Mm -hmm. And we had talked about um, what kinds of acts are involved in sexual mm -hmm. abuse. Many people, including people involved in the acts themselves, have different ways of defining it. Um, of course, it involves intercourse, but it involves numbers of other kinds of acts, fondling of mm -hmm. genitals. Um, indecent exposure, with the child being forced to look at an adult's genitals, masturbation, touching an adult's genitals, um, and a variety of other acts. And we often find that parents and children need some education in mm -hmm. what is involved in abuse. Um, okay. Um, I think a, a, a big question that comes to a lot of people's minds when like, you describe what the definition of sexual abuse is, is like, what, why would an adult do that to um, his or her child? 
Well, that's a good question. There's a lot of research going yeah. on about that. But sexual abuse really has nothing to do with sex per se. Mm -hmm. Sex is a vehicle, but it's really a misuse of power. An adult is misusing their um, stature with the child to coerce a child into an activity that's developmentally inappropriate for the child. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, offenders are people who feel very inadequate about themselves. They have a very, we say they have a very low self-esteem. That can be for number of, numbers of reasons. It can be because of a household in which they were raised where they were not allowed to be appropriately independent and assertive. Uh, oftentimes we find offenders have been sexually abused themselves, but not all. Some of them come mm -hmm. from alcoholic families or families where there's been a significant degree of physical abuse, battering of their mothers that they've observed. Um, we know that sexual abuse primarily, uh, when we think of offenders, involves men, and there's, but there are a small percentage of women who are also offenders. And I had meant to say this at the beginning of the show, but in terms of statistics, we know that it's right now one out of three? One out of three girls, okay. um, one out of six boys. And in nine out of ten cases, a child knows their offender fairly well. Mm -hmm. If it's not an immediate family member, it's um, a friend of the family, an acquaintance of the family. We talked earlier about the myth that sexual abuse occurs frequently in daycare centers, and that's mm -hmm. not true. Um, sexual abuse occurs most frequently within the household. Mm -hmm. And the age group that, that we're talking about in terms of the people who are the victims of the abuse, are the, the most common age is between? Between 6 and 12 is the highest risk for abuse occurring, but sexual abuse occurs at all ages from early infancy mm -hmm. through, we, we usually define 18 years old for reporting standards, mm -hmm. um, but it occurs at any age. But 6 to 12 year old prepubescent girls are most likely to be offended. Mm -hmm. Given um, the secrecy around sexual abuse, what would somebody, either as a, another adult, as a teacher, as a friend of the family, what would they look for um, in terms of behaviors among children that would indicate to them that they might be sexual abuse survivors? Okay. Well, let me start with the fact that while there may in some cases be physical evidence of sexual abuse, oftentimes there's not so that you, there may be bruises, lacerations, VD, um, some kind of um, infection, pregnancy, obvious kinds of signs. But most often, parents and teachers will note behavioral symptoms that mm -hmm. children exhibit. Very young children um, exhibit regression, or for parents, a return to more babyish behavior. A child who may have been dry at night and dry during the day will start wetting, and mm -hmm. it's fairly unexplainable. Um, children may become more withdrawn, they may cry more often. They may tell a parent, I don't want to go to to auntie's house or I don't want to go to grandma's house or um, I don't want to be with grandpa in the car. Um, parents need to pay attention to those kinds of statements. Um, for older children, um, oftentimes teachers will notice a drop in grades, mm -hmm. a change of pulling away from peer activities, dropping out of clubs and groups. Um, an unwillingness to participate in gym. Um, some children have a hard time paying attention in school because they're so distracted with the mm -hmm. thoughts of what's been happening to them. Some children can't sit because they're sore, they're physically hurting. Mm. And um, we see lots of children who refuse to participate in activities such as gym because they're embarrassed to take off their clothes. They, they feel someone will know that they've been abused by mm -hmm. the fact that they're changing clothes, mm -hmm. which is not true. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, children do not uh, choose to disclose the sexual abuse, you know, either out of fear or loyalty to the family. And oftentimes, it's adults who are noticing the behaviors or the change in behaviors um, that lead lead them to question the child or to make a report. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned an interesting thing in terms of why, um, you know, there's, there's a huge societal taboo against this. What, w w how do you understand why young people would go along with it? Well, children like to please adults. That's mm -hmm. one reason they go along. They, they, they want to make the people in their life happy. Um, and Sex, 
becomes very confused with nurturance. Mm -hmm. If this is a way a child gets attention in the family, then they may go along for those reasons. Children comply because they're threatened or they're tricked or they're bribed into an activity and become so confused about what's happening to them and they, they, that they're fearful about telling or they don't know enough to tell. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes children tell me that they comply because they're trying to protect their mother. They're mm -hmm. they, the offender may say, your mother will have a heart attack if she finds out or your mother will um, be sent to jail or you'll be sent to a foster home. Mm -hmm. So children comply to keep the family intact, to keep the family together. Um, children are often told... Which is an awesome responsibility. Right. Yeah. It, it is, and, and uh, very often in families where sexual abuse is going on, there's a reversal of roles mm -hmm. um, in families. Children are playing adult roles and adults are not protecting and nurturing children appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, children oftentimes are given little treats along mm -hmm. with abuse and in accepting those treats they feel complicit, they feel mm -hmm. guilty and then they feel they can't tell. And also a child who's told by an offender, um, you'll go to jail if you tell, has no way um, cognitively to, to say, well that's silly. Mm -hmm. A child believes what mm -hmm. an adult mm -hmm. tells them. Mm -hmm. um, also, so it seems like from what you're saying that the blame aspect is in some ways one of the more difficult things to deal yes, with when you're working in with young people. Yes, in treatment, the, the guilt that the child feels and the self-blame self um, is very difficult. It's a, it's a long-term treatment issue. I think one of the most important things for parents or a teacher uh, to say to a child when a child might disclose is, I believe you. Mm -hmm. That's very important right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually um, leads up to the tape that I have for the first tape insert, which is um, a tape called A Touchy Subject. And the tape is fairly self-explanatory, but um, it's an example of what a parent can do to empower their child to um, assert their space in the world um, to be able to feel safe. So why don't we go to that tape? And then when we come back, we'll be speaking with Elizabeth. This father knows he can be direct and specific when he talks to his son. When they coming? They're not going to be here for another hour, Jake. Hey, you don't really want to go to Michael's, do you? Yes! <laughs> yes, 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 yes! Oh! Hey, do you remember our telephone number? 288-9175. I'm impressed. Where are they? Slow down, Jake. They'll be here. I see you're prepared for anything. I haven't seen old Fozzie in a long time. Uh, mom, mom threw that in. Yeah, I'll bet. Hey, why don't you come in here and exercise with me? Oh, oh come here. Give me a hug, you. Oh. Roll over. Do some exercises with me. All right? Ready to do some sit-ups? Here we go. See the way I take care of this old Hulk of mine? What Hulk? Are you ever a wrestler? No. I'm talking about my body. I try and keep it in shape. And I want you to do the same thing. Because you got a great body. Let me see that muscle. I mean, come on. Oh, look at that muscle. Nobody's going to mess with this guy. Has anybody ever messed with you? No. I mean, you know, touched you like over here? No. Oh, you ever touched anybody there? No. You sure? I'm sure. Good. You know, one day somebody might try and do that. And it could be somebody you know, somebody you like even. And it might feel weird or funny. But you just remember, your body is private property. No trespassing. Serious business now. You have my permission to go and... Zap them, pow, bam! No, no. I'm serious now. You tell them no, N-O. Get out, get lost. And what else? Chill out, quit yeah. it. What else? I'll tell my dad on you. Good. And what do you do if you see someone like 
Dracula or the Wolfman in the movie. <coughs> louder than that. <coughs> Even louder. <coughs> Good. And then you run out of there faster than Superman. You come tell me and Mom. And it doesn't matter who it is. It could be somebody's bigger brother or sister even. You know, a person doesn't have to look like a bad guy to hurt you or to make you feel yucky. It could be someone really nice, really dear to us. But if they do something that makes you feel funny, that's not nice. Your body is one thing you don't have to share with anyone. Okay, champ? Okay. All right. Let's do a little practice self-defense like a fire drill, all right? What do you say? Stop! And what else? Get out of here! And what else? I'll tell my dad on and you! And what else? Ah! That's good, and then you run out of there as fast as you can, you come tell me or mom, all right? Okay. Okay, let's go, let's go fly away now! Up uh, and away! In the next family, the kids roughhousing. You didn't get to see the tape. Are you in the studio? Yeah, huh? Good evening. We're back. This is the Somerville Producers Group, and my name is Rosie McMahon, and tonight our subject is sexual abuse. We were just speaking with Fran Rowley, who works at the Somerville Mental Health Center as a therapist, and we will now be talking with Elizabeth Sean Viner, who is a child interview specialist at the Child Abuse Unit at the Middlesex DA Tom Riley's office. And I guess I would just like to first ask you um, what what do you what are your what is your knowledge of this of the statistics in is it the massachusetts area is it in the middlesex um we're with the middlesex da's office so we only okay. get referrals for the middlesex da's office okay. um the child abuse unit started in about uh, the summer of 1989 so our statistics are from then at this point the, the statistics before then weren't for a specific unit mm -hmm. um, and maybe i should just briefly say what this unit is so that people yeah, understand because yeah. it's a relatively new concept um, as a child interviewer, it's again a new idea in the DA's office and there's three people that work on a case when we get a referral from either the dis Department of Social Services or from the police. Mm -hmm. So there's a, an assistant district attorney who's assigned, who's a lawyer obviously, there's a victim witness advocate who's more of a human service aspect as well as someone who's quite knowledgeable of the court system and then there's myself and there's three of us at the unit who is a child interviewer, and my job is pretty much to um, focus on doing investigative interviews, often in a team fashion, so that either the two other people that I work with or other uh, multidisciplinary t uh, professionals would be viewing through a one-way mirror. Mm -hmm. um, since, I'd say we, we're figuring that we get in the county, this Middlesex County, about 700 cases a year. Um, and there's a, uh, actually more than that in victims. Um, not all of those are family-related cases. There are all sorts of... Just to ask you to explain yeah. something, when you say 700 cases, which is different than victims, what, what do you well, mean? Well, we count cases um, that's... There are more victims sometimes than there are cases. Okay. There may be one perpetrator and more than one victim in a okay. case. Um, so it's a large number. It's anywhere from 600 to 700 a year. It's, it's varied. Um, and, and recently in the Globe, there were statistics that, they, that those numbers are increasing. Mm -hmm. So of those cases, we're, uh, we are mandated by law to do some type of an investigation. Mm -hmm. um, of those cases that are investigated, a little less than 30% are actually prosecuted. Okay. And when a case is prosecuted, um, that means that it's taken to court, right? Um, yes, that, that there are criminal charges brought forth, and the Commonwealth, the state, has taken charges against a, a particular person or persons. Okay. So when when that happens, I guess I, I have two questions. One is, what you know, what could result from a case being prosecuted, and then the what other question the uh, is, what happens to all these other cases, and okay. what is the point in, in in involving the legal system? In this? Well, let me two begin about how yeah. we get investigations and what happens. The, the Department of Social Services is mandated to investigate cases also. And they and there's something called a reporting law. And so many people are mandated reporters, therapists, teachers, um, uh, all sorts of professionals, doctors, nurses, that would come into contact with children. Um, police officers, that type of a, of a professional. And when they make their report to the Department of Social Services, then 
Department of Social Services, who I'm going to refer to as DSS, mm -hmm. then is now mandated, and I believe the law was in 1983 that it passed, mandating that they then refer cases to the DA's offices all through the state. So that is how we get the investigations. And we work together with these other agencies, with, with DSS, often jointly on the investigation during that 10 minute, uh, 10 day time period that they're mandated to do the investigation. And then also with many other, with therapists, with physicians, uh, with teachers, with uh, counselors, all sorts of other people in the community. And so we work jointly together as teams mm -hmm. trying to uh, figure out what are we going to do with this information that we've received. And as I said, a little less than 30% of those cases um, are deemed appropriate cases for prosecution. And that is appropriate for, for a lot of people, family, our office, age of child, um, therapeutically appropriately uh, appropriate. So there's many factors that, that come into it. Mm -hmm. um, of the cases that we investigate that are not prosecuted, um, we, like I said earlier, there's a, particularly the victim witness advocate, plays a big role in trying to make sure that that family has services that are going to help them deal with the abuse. The fact that there's no prosecution in no way reflects the fact that abuse didn't happen. Mm -hmm. In fact, very few of our cases have ever been, in our opinion, um, in any way clear that there wasn't abuse. Mm -hmm. There are just many other reasons why prosecution is not always the appropriate um, uh, route to mm -hmm. take. Is it, I mean, is it through prosecution, though, that... Mike's the town. Is it through prosecution that people are... Is that, does that seem to be the best way to get people involved um, in some kind of treatment, the offender I'm talking about? Um, Fran may be able to speak better about this, but my experience has been that um, in referring to, uh, in getting offenders of sexual abuse into treatment, those treatment groups have come back and said to us, we need some type of court mandate. There needs to be some type of referral from some almost a negative incentive to stay with it. That the, the level of denial is so huge in these cases and in these, with these people mm -hmm. that often if they just try and resolve it within the family and not get anybody else involved, maybe there would be six months of treatment and it would end. And I think everybody working in this field knows that sometimes it's years and years and mm -hmm. years of treatment that's mm -hmm. needed and that mm -hmm. um, it, it's that negative incentive that is, needs to help. Yeah. And when you speak about level of denial, and I guess I, Fran or Debbie, if you want to jump in, I, I hear you not just talking so much about it's not just the offender that you're talking about, but sort of the family unit. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, that plays a big part in people's reluctance. Um, to want to go forward. To want to go forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just say that oftentimes in, um, parents have their own sexual abuse history that they may have, in fact, blocked out of their memory. And it, when they have a disclosure that their child has been abused, lots of feelings come up. They don't necessarily understand where all that anxiety is coming from, or sometimes all of a sudden they'll remember, recall their own childhood trauma. So it makes it doubly difficult for those parents to then get involved with treatment for their child because they also need to work through their own mm -hmm. issues that they've been and denying. As we were talking about before, I mean, even if somebody wasn't themselves a sexual abuse survivor, that in being an adult in a position where you're hearing about that can can, you don't have to be a sexual abuse survivor to get uncomfortable with no, that. That's true. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, lots of times in talking about survivors, people will talk about children lying about sexual abuse. And what I think is very true is that, in fact, there is very little incentive for children to lie about being sexually abused. And I really believe that we lie to get out of trouble, not into trouble. And once you disclose that you've been sexually abused, your life does not become a day at the beach. I mean, kids right. don't like spending afternoons in therapy and talking to DSS workers. I think that there's a lot of incentive for an adult who was sexually abused as a child, child or an offender to deny their involvement in sexual abuse. I mean, there's a lot of incentive for offenders not to acknowledge their behavior because society doesn't look very positively upon that. So I think that that's really where the incentive for denial really comes in and that we really need to acknowledge that when it goes, reflects back onto children, 
that children are really asking for help and in fact not lying and that if they are lying it's about saying I don't want to go to Uncle Joe's house because there's a rat in the basement when in fact there isn't really a rat in the basement but the rat in the basement is Uncle Joe mm -hmm. and why is it the kids are making up those kind of stories? Mm -hmm. In fact I think it, it's often more likely that what you'll find is after a child has disclosed either accidentally or purposefully that the child will take it back and lie about the statement they made about being abused. Mm. It's, it's a protective reaction they mm. have from all of the chaos that they see um, in the family and the, the family's perhaps negative reaction to what they've said. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a, something we see frequently. Mm. And I think one of the things that, that feeds into that is the perception of what happens once there's a disclosure. Yeah. And one of what we've been trying to do in the last few years is combine all of our agency's efforts and uh, when we're investigating these cases because there are a lot of people and agencies and professionals that all of a sudden need to hear about that. Um, not only do we now hear about these cases immediately, we always have as a DA's office work closely with our local police, but now also please get the referrals as well mm -hmm. um, at the same time. And then there's the, we have a therapy element um, where we, we include therapists in our investigations as well as DSS. So there's something that, that's not such a new idea, but relatively new to this area, I'd say in the last four years, um, called a SANE team, and that uh, stands for Sexual Abuse Investigative Network. And, and that's a team um, of multidisciplinary professionals. And it's an organized team in that it meets once a week, and we, and we try and find appropriate cases for a SANE team. And in that sense, we combine everybody's efforts. One person does the interview. By, my, by myself being an interviewer, I often am that person in my, on my teams to do the interview and the other professionals observe and then have time. Um, I take a break or we find a way for them to let me know if there's something I haven't asked to get the information that they'd like to get from the child mm -hmm. during that interview. Um, and the interviews are all done um, very sensitively and we're trained and working with very, very young children all through teens. Um, so I think what, people's what, perception is that it, it's going to be a horrible interrogative process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I guess when I hear about you being a child interview specialist, I think, wow, that you, I mean, that seems like a very um, to have to be the one in the position of finding out the information. What what do you what do you feel? I mean, you believe that it's a good thing for a person to disclose and to pursue uh, a legal avenue in terms of trying to deal with that? Is that correct? Well, I think say? we're very um, realistic. And like I said earlier, it isn't always the right avenue for everybody. Mm. But I believe that it's an important uh, part of the system. And it's important to be a part of the investigation at its early stages. Because the earlier we're involved, the less intrusive sometimes we are. For instance, if, if a case is deemed appropriate for prosecution, we have a child who's old enough to talk and want, and a family who would like to participate in prosecution. We now um, are often using a videotape for purposes of grand jury hmm. instead of a child having to go into a grand jury live. And a grand jury from is Which is a, what people used to have to do, Exactly, right? yeah. used to have to ask children to go into the grand jury. Um, that's not in lieu of trial, and these tapes are not used instead of testifying in an actual trial. But to get a case into the system, into the superior court system, we now sometimes can have a child make a tape Mm -hmm. um, with uh, giving their testimony in a, in a comfortable space that's geared to children instead of having to go into a courthouse. And that may be the end of their actual involvement. Between 80 and 90 percent of the cases prosecuted actually never go to trial. There are what we call change of pleas. The perpetrators actually plead guilty um, in court. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a, a large number of these cases where kids never have to testify the most involvement was maybe one or two interviews. Mm -hmm. so. so what do you what do you perceive as um, the most, uh, this is, people always hate these questions, but mm. the, mo the most important aspect of your work as a child interview specialist, w what would you say? I think um, there's an important function in helping a child disclose in a way that's hopefully, I feel I do a sensitive, um, but thorough and, and helpful interview mm -hmm. and the information needs to be obtained by lots of different people and so I feel that by someone like myself whose whole focus is doing that mm -hmm. um, we're making it a, a better system for kids to be involved and their families. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we're about ready to go to our second tape and this tape is going to lead us into our third segment which we'll be able to talk a lot more about 
prevention. Um, and this tape is made by a group um, called Women Make Movies. It's called Five Out of Five. A group of young people put it together. So why don't we watch the tape, and when we come back, we can talk a lot more about prevention of sexual abuse. got together and shared their secret. Each of them had been sexually abused. Now nobody likes to talk about sexual assault, <laughs> but we have to, especially us kids, because it happens to so many of us. Would you believe one in four girls and one in seven boys is sexually assaulted by the age of 14? Think about it. Sexual assault is any unwanted or forced sexual contact. It includes rape, incest, and verbal or physical harassment. We're the Acting Out Teen Theater, and we're here to tell their story because their story can happen to any one of us. We're five out of five trying to survive. Don't buy us, we have something to hide. It's not our thing, cause you're the thing. Hey, boys and girls, women and men, it's time to make sure it never happens again. They're telling me it's one in four. But I look around to see many all of these folks walking around in shame. Some thought and you thinking they're too plain. There are folks walking around who were telling us lies. So we're here to say we got nothing to hide. I really wanted to be Johnny's girl, but he said I had to go all the way. One night he got really ugly. I never knew he would hurt me. We were strangers at first and thought we were weird. We had five secrets. And nobody did. To tell the story we knew was true. So we just sat there sad and blue. We were scared that we'd done something wrong. No, no one would be the first to sing this song. My father beat me up for not defending myself. What was I supposed to do against three 16-year-olds? I was only 12. And nothing but lies came from your tongue. He said everybody was doing this and we weren't hurting anybody. I said, no, Daddy, you're just killing me. You kept the secret you told us to hide. My mother's friend made me feel uncomfortable every time I delivered groceries to our house. You made us feel we had no crime. Sometimes I hated watching TV because my uncle would touch me while everybody was in the room. He hid behind curtains and bedroom walls. When I was 14, my best friend's brother said, I'm going to show you how it is to be a real woman. Watch out now, because you're going to fall.
assault is happening every day to kids we know. What can you do if you're one of these kids? Tell someone you trust. You have the right not to be touched in ways that hurt, frighten, or confuse you. Even if those touches come from someone you know and love. A date is not a contract for sex. Trust your instincts and funny feelings. If you think you're being pressured into unwanted sex, you probably are. Hi, we're back. This is the Somerville Producers Group, and tonight's subject is sexual abuse. My name is Rosie McMahon, and we're talking now with our third guest, Debbie Lewis, who is a community education coordinator at the Mass Cap Prevention Center. And um, I guess uh, most of your work is about prevention, and I'd like you to describe a little bit about what that means, you know, in concrete terms, and then I'd like to talk about what we can do in terms of prevention and sexual abuse. Okay, well, uh, the program that I work with, which is, um, has been up until this point a statewide regional training and education center in the area of child assault prevention, is a primary prevention program. And so what, by that, what I mean is that we provide prevention information to the general public um, with the assumption that we're reaching people before, in fact, an assault has happened. So that different from victim identification or treatment, it's really aimed at giving information to children and adults prior to an assault. And that the basic philosophy, I think the primary philosophy of our program is about empowerment and talking to both children and adults about things that they can do, giving them very concrete do messages and skills for how to effectively identify and respond to assaultive situations and to make that information accessible to everyone in the community. And I think that that's particularly important because what we know about sexual assault is that it's not something that happens to a select population of people, that it crosses racial, ethnic, geographic, cultural um, barriers, that it's something that happens to boys as well as girls. And I think for mm -hmm. a long time, the statistics we were getting were mostly around girls. And we've seen a significant increase, witness yeah. the statistics that you shared earlier about the increase in disclosure of boy victims. So it's important that we acknowledge that it happens to everyone and that that information is accessible. It also therefore means that we do adaptations for special needs communities, for the deaf and hard of hearing community, mm -hmm. so that everyone in the community is able to get the information at the same amount, of t at the same time. So when you go out into the community, um, what, do you, what do you do? Like when you're working with adults, what are you, what are you doing with them? Well, what we do is we provide, I mean, our, our basic goal of, of prevention is to give people accurate information, first of all, about assault. And when we talk about assault, again, we're looking at a whole spectrum, so we're not just looking at sexual abuse. In our program in particular, we look at a whole continuum, starting over here with confrontation on a playground and how to deal with the verbal intimidation of a bully 
to an attempted assault by a stranger, which is happens the least often, but is the thing that children traditionally have been talked about the most, talked to about the most. So they had the most fear and anxiety about that to over here talking about sexual assault and incest. So that initially we need to give people accurate information about that, um, similar to what you talked about in terms of letting people know that for the most part, assaults happen by people that they know. We also focus on giving both children and adults problem solving skills. So for adults, it's problem solving skills in, in communication skills on how to talk to their children about prevention in a, much the same way as the videotape that you showed, um, a father having a conversation with his son about personal safety and how to be assertive and how to protect himself. Um, for children, it's about also how to um, develop problem solving skills for identifying potentially assaultive situations and how to either um, avoid them and or effectively respond to them. I think what's really important for me um, in doing this work is to make a distinction between the fact that we can't prevent assault from happening. And so the word prevention in that sense is a little misleading because I, I don't have any control over your behavior. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of control over my ability to get the amount of information and knowledge I need to effectively identify your behavior if it's a risk to me and to effectively respond, avoid, and or get help for dealing with that situation. How do you That's talk, really the When goal. you talk with adults and children about this, though, how do you not, like, totally scare them? Well, we talk to adults very differently than we yeah. talk to children. Our particular model as it exists right now, um, when it's presented to children, is a combination of guided discussions and role plays. And we talk to children about rights, and we start with this concept of talking to children about having basic rights to be safe, strong, and free and that all children should have those rights. And that when somebody takes those rights away, we have a problem. We may feel uncomfortable, we may feel frightened, we may not know what to do. And what is it that we can do? What are some of the skills that we can learn to effectively handle those situations? We focus on three basic problem-solving skills. Assertiveness, saying no, um, saying no in a loud and assertive manner. Peer support, a very important piece of the work that we do. I think mm -hmm. the kids spend a lot of time with other children and that traditionally they've been taught to rely on adults for support, and whereas I think that's very important, there are times that adults aren't around. Well, and wait, and let me just say my other um, sure. strategy, which is using a supportive network of trusted adults for help and assistance, because we don't want the responsibility to fall solely on the shoulders of children. And I think there's a misconception sometimes that when we're doing prevention, we're taking the responsibility away from adults and putting it on children. And in fact, we see it more as a shared responsibility between children and adults. And you see children feeling more empowered after Absolutely. This. I mean, what's really exciting for both children and adults, I mean, I think that we are constantly bombarded through the media, through the newspaper, with stories and TV shows and articles about how horrible it is out there, you know, and the increase in sexual abuse. And I think that that's really overwhelming. And I think if that's all you get, that you develop this sense of hopelessness, there's nothing to do. And I think by going in and talking to kids about what they can do and do messages, their anxiety really gets reduced. I think it's the lack of knowledge that really increases our fear and anxiety. It's kind of like fire safety or crossing the street safely. You know, when you teach a kid how to get out of the house safely, we don't find them sleeping on the front lawn because they're afraid that the house is going to burn yeah. down. Yeah. We find them saying, oh great, I can go to sleep because I know what to do in case of a fire. And it's the same thing with personal body safety. And it's the same thing for parents. Mm -hmm. Feeling like there's something that they can do. There's a way that they can talk to their kids. They don't need a master's degree in 14 years of sexual abuse experience to do this work with their kids. Except that it seems if we give children um, the power that you're talking about, there, there seems, and any of you can respond to this, I mean, there is sort of, the adult is relinquishing certain control and um, I can see that being a very uncomfortable thing for a lot of adults to do. Absolutely. To, to, to be, if they're going to be, if they're going to be giving children this kind of space that, um, Oh, it's very anxiety-producing. I mean, I think yeah. for parents, you know, we think, I mean, how many of us have seen books that say it's okay to say no? You know, and we think that's a great solution. And I think that it can be a very effective tool. You say that to a lot of adults, and they get really anxious that, like, chaos is going to reign in their home. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we talk to adults about, and that's why it's important to do prevention education with adults as well as children, mm -hmm. because we all need education. And what we talk to adults is making a distinction between, with their kids, rights, rules, and responsibilities, and that clearing the table or cleaning your room is not going to threaten your personal safety, and that you can have a conversation with kids about that, and that 
the beauty of that is that you're actually having that conversation and opening up those avenues of communication. And I think sort of the foundation building block of any kind of prevention education is communication. So what we do is we talk to parents about how to deal with kids when they come up and they say, well, I got permission to say no in my prevention program today at school, and so I'm not going to clear the table. And to have a conversation about what that means. Mm -hmm. Kids are testing out their new knowledge. And I think that on the one hand, we don't have to relinquish all our control. On the other hand, we need to respect their process of testing that out. Mm -hmm. Because if we say categorically, you can't say no to adults or don't say no to adults in this home, we're really setting children up because some less well-intentioned person is going to come along and ask them to do something that may not be clearing your table or is well-intentioned. And if that child doesn't know that they have the right to say no, and if that isn't supported by the adults that they know in their life, it's going to be really hard to say that to another person. How would you respond to this, though? If, um, what, if, what if in your education, your prevention education, you end up speaking to young people who are in homes where it's not what you're telling them. It is, I am the adult in this mm -hmm. family. You do what I say. How, and, and not only that, what if, what if you end up speaking to young people who are themselves sexual abuse survivors and they, you know, they're listening to, oh, I, all I need to do, I, I've got to be assertive, and, and mm -hmm. then the, the feeling inadequate in, in that ability. Like, what, what do you do for that young person, I guess? Well, I think you raised two separate questions. I mean, the first one about what do you do if you go home in a house where that's not mm -hmm. allowed, I mean, I think that that's really important to acknowledge. And I think that part about, of that is acknowledging the larger family and social context in which we live. And in some communities, if as an adult you are disempowered every single day in your life because you're a person of color or you're from a particular minority population or you're a special needs person, the, play, the only place that you may feel in control is in your home with your kids. Mm -hmm. And so. I think that all I can say to that is that we need to continue to do parenting education work with parents and that it's very important in our prevention programs that we say to kids, you do the best that you can do. And that if you can do one of these things, if you can do all of these things, if immediately you can't do any of them, that that's okay, that there's no such thing as flunking prevention 101. I think it's really important that we create as many options as possible. Our program, as I say, goes in with three basic strategies that we reinforce, but we really encourage kids to come up with other strategies because we have to give the broadest range of options for just the reasons that you say kids need to feel, if I didn't do this, that's okay, I did the best I could. Mm -hmm. And we don't want them to feel guilty for having not been able to do what was told in the class. For kids that were sexually abused, I think it is really, really important, as you did in the beginning of the show, to acknowledge that, to make yourself available for kids to come and talk to you. When we do our programs in the classroom, we always have workshop leaders be available afterwards for what we've called in the past talk time, which is a time for kids to come down afterwards and share their thoughts about the program, what they liked, what they didn't like, what they thought. That's also a time if, for kids to talk to people if something came up for them around something that's going on in their life. And for some kids, they may not be able to integrate the information because of what's going on in their home immediately. But what we may do is give them permission to come forward six months, three months, a year down the line because somebody said to them in some context, you don't have to let this happen to you. and It's okay to talk to somebody about it. It's kind of like planting the seed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what, what would you say, though? Say I'm, say I'm a teacher and I'm watching this show and I say, okay, I, I want to I be in touch with this and I, and, and I want to be aware of whether or not I have students in my classroom who are sexually abused, but it makes me feel really uncomfortable <laughs> with the idea of students approaching me like, oh my, how, I, don't, I don't know if I want to make myself open mm -hmm. to inviting people to come and talk to me about this. Like, how do, you, how do you encourage people to be more comfortable with that? What, or what, is, what is that about, you know? Well, first of all, I would want to say that I would, and, and feel free to jump sure. in. I mean, it's a distinction between saying I want to know that there are kids in my classroom who have been sexually abused versus I want to do prevention education in mm -hmm. my classroom. Mm -hmm. And those are two different things. And they're both important. I would just say that there are different tracks that I would go for each of those. I think for teachers who want to do prevention education with their kids, that they can look into curriculums themselves that are teacher taught or they can contact resources in their community have people come in and do that kind of work with their kids. If they want to learn more about how to identify children who have been sexually abused, I think having, you know, anybody who has the knowledge of any of the people on this panel come in and talk to them and provide an in-service mm -hmm. around what are the warning signs that, as they've been explained on this show, and to really sensitize them to some of those issues mm -hmm. would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's important to recognize your limits. 
that we can all be available and accessible to do this work and that that's okay. If you're not comfortable for whatever reason, that's okay. It's important to identify other people who are. Mm. I, I just want to underscore that. I think it's really important for teachers and for parents not to feel alone mm -hmm. with a concern that ev every school has a guidance counseling department in Somerville. Our clinic consults to the high school and, and to many of the elementary schools. We're always available to consult by phone. You can call DSS and ask for an anonymous consultation. Um, and I think that that's really helpful, uh, especially for teachers who have a concern or a parent who has a concern. I think concerns eat away at teachers and parents yes. when they're left unaddressed and, and that you don't need to hold on to that anxiety. And there's a lot of wonderful um, literature for parents and for professionals that's available now. We're going to roll some of them at the end. Um, and it helps to do that reading if you're a teacher. It helps to desensitize you to hearing the words and the and, and uh, to be familiar with the way children talk about sexual, sexual abuse. Most children don't come in at six years of age and say, mm -hmm. I had intercourse with my father. They said, somebody's fiddling around with me, somebody's playing with me. Um, you need to be familiar with the way children discuss the topic. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of help in the community. Mm -hmm. I also think by doing that, it also gives you a chance to sort of sort out your own feelings sure. that you may have personally related to this issue because I think again looking at the statistics that we talked about you know we are not talking about like those people out there we're talking about like those of us here in our communities in our families in our schools among our colleagues and that I think that there are a lot of us that have had experiences ourselves or know someone a family member or a loved one and we're going to have some feelings about those and as we start to do this whether it's as a therapist or a teacher that we're going to have some feelings come up and absolutely to do some preliminary work to talk to people for support is really important and there's some wonderful resources in this community mm -hmm. I just wanted to add I mean Debbie brought up the fact that you know anybody who might be working in this area could have had some experience I think it's important to say that knowing what we know about Middlesex County the reports come from every city and town in the county regardless of um, wealth and regardless of ethnic background um, so we see it happening everywhere, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, that doesn't seem to be what characterizes why abuse happens in families. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, to follow up on this whole thing about the discomfort, because I feel like it's that, that the discomfort around talking about abuse um, it plays a, a pretty, <laughs> that plays a large role in, in people not talking about it. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what do you, um, what does someone do? Say they've never talked to their child about sex, you know? Well, what do they, how, do they, how do they talk about this with, with their children? I mean, you're mentioning going to places where they can get support and that there's resources in the community, but like right now, what could we tell somebody? Um, I just want to say one thing about this. I mean, it, it, first of all, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with sex. What it has to do with is how you listen to your children and what you pay attention to. And that has to start really from day one. If it hasn't, if you're being enlightened anywhere later in your child's age, and you can then begin to start paying attention to what they're saying to you and what they're doing, as Fran talked about, behavioral symptoms, too. Mm -hmm. And you said it all before the show, that you had said it sort of is, it's not something that just comes natural, either. Right. It's something you got to work at. And you right. can go yeah. to parenting groups. I mean, there are also lots of books for kids. I mean, it's not about sitting down with your, you know, six-year-old and saying, so let me tell you what to do if somebody tries to rape you. I mean, that there's lots of mm -hmm. ways. And I mean, you know, for if you don't know and you haven't talked to somebody, you think maybe that's what you're expected to right. do. People think that's what we're going to do in the classroom. We sit down and we talk about rights to be safe, strong, and free. And what does it feel like when somebody bullies you on the playground, when somebody touches you in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable? And part of that is saying to kids, you know, tell me about ways that, that I touch you that makes you feel great. And tell me about ways that I touch you that doesn't make you feel so great. And kids may say, well, you know, I don't like it when you tickle me on my feet. You know, just very general conversation like that. And you can use books, you can use coloring books, activity books to help ease you into that if you don't feel comfortable doing that by yourself. But that again, the cornerstone is really communication. And that I think that the sooner we begin to get that and to start to do that kind of work with our kids, I mean, I really believe that that's in the long run really going to turn around sort of this whole pattern of victimization, that the work that people are doing as therapists and in the uh, victims' witness programs are crucial. But they're doing, but we're doing, and, and myself as a therapist, but we're doing that work with people that have already been victimized. Mm -hmm. And my goal in the long run is to give the information to kids before they've been victimized so it never has to happen. Or it happens one time 
and they go to somebody and they say, this has happened to me, can I talk about it? Boy, wouldn't our work be easier? Sure. Mm. Yeah. Um, being a parent, you know, the, the, I just want to underscore that the education begins very early from infancy and, and appreciating your child and protecting your child. And we all teach our children names for eyes, nose, lips. But it's important to teach um, a child names for private parts, to use penis and vagina. They can, you know, a boy can say it's his pee pee, but he also knows the word penis. That um, if you need help in, in learning those words yourself and, and saying those words, that's available, but that's really important. Many of the children I see have no words for their genital areas mm -hmm. other than some very idiosyncratic names. And it's very helpful for children if parents can try to become comfortable mm -hmm. and use those words themselves. Mm -hmm. Ask questions. What are things that make you feel comfortable? What are things that make you feel uncomfortable? Starting from a place of asking questions and gathering information mm -hmm. rather than making assumptions. Yeah. Or sometimes just getting an understanding of what your child already knows or how to teach them to playing what if games. What if this yes. happened? Um, is a, is a wonderful way to educate children at home. And asking kids to do the what if back, because when right. kids do the what if back, you get a real sense of what their worst fear is. So you may say to a kid, my role is, what if you were walking home and it started to rain and you didn't have a raincoat on, what would you do? And then you say to a kid, it's your turn, and they say, what if, and you know, I've had kids say, what if I was walking down the street and somebody grabbed me in a car and they tied me up and they took all my clothes off and what would I do? Now that gives you really good insight into what a child's fearful of. Mm -hmm. You know, so that that can be a wonderful tool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds very good, and it is close to the end of our show. And I want to thank you, Fran, Elizabeth, and yeah. Debbie, for joining me tonight. And I hope that um, this show has been helpful in providing uh, folks out there here <laughs> with information about the subject of sexual abuse. Because um, I think sometimes we feel like um, it's not something that we're able to easily um, receive information and support. And I'd like to again say that if watching this show brought up feelings for some people that um, we're going to be giving some names and numbers at the end of the show. And if you so choose not to go to those resources that you speak with somebody. Um, and I thank you for the Somerville Producers Group. Good night. to the mirror and I see that reflection in my eyes I wonder if I'll be weary forever or if I'll cut this ugly picture down to size I don't want your woeful pity I don't need a miraculous saint to light the way I don't need a song and dance that's pretty. I just need for you to believe me when I say that it wasn't me that had the problem. It's just me that's left to carry on. It wasn't me that had the problem. It's just me that's left to sing this old. I swear, sometimes this world is crazy With all the doctors and lawyers and preachers and teachers Telling so many victims these lies You shouldn't have worn that dress You shouldn't have walked that way You shouldn't have been alone Home is where you should stay You shouldn't have said hello You shouldn't have had that drink you should have just said no You certainly had time to think You should have been nice and sweet You should have run out that door It wasn't a well-lit street You certainly knew the score It could have been worse for you You're lucky to be alive There's lots of help out there Now don't you give me that jive Cause I don't think if the world caved in That you'd say the same Or if your house